Hello, this is Chris Jewett with Extreme Flight RC. Welcome to Build Video 3. Today we're going to go ahead and finish up the fuselage. We're going to start with the rudder pull pull, the electronics in the fuselage, the fuel tank, the engine, mufflers, and cowling, and then we'll move on to the next build video. Let's get started. As a cleanup note from the previous video, the tailwheel assembly nut and collar need to be flipped over on the tailwheel to provide clearance to the rudder. Again, installing the rudder pull pull by installing the rudder servo the rudder servo arm. You want to make sure that the servo arm is centered and moving in the proper direction. There are several options in this kit for setting up rudder servos. You could put one in the tail with a direct linkage or you could put one or two in the fuselage with the pull pull. In this setup I'm going to use one servo in the fuselage with a pull pull. The following video shows you how to set up the pull pull cables. My technique for pull pull cables is to run the wire through the keeper one time and then come back through a second time to create a locking loop. If you hold the tail in place and pull on the wire, it'll tighten down the locking loop onto the keeper. This will give you a sliding assembly that'll allow you to adjust the length of the loop. Once you've got the length of the loop desired, crimp the keeper down using a pair of pliers that don't have any ridges on them and then CA that in place and finally add a piece of heat shrink over it for cosmetic covering. Once you have built two pull pull wires with connectors on one end each, let's open up the holes in the fuselage where the wires enter from the rudder. I personally think it's easier to fish the wires from the tail forward versus the opposite, but it could be done in either direction. Here I'm using the automotive parts grabber to grab the pull pull wire and fish it through the fuselage. To rig the loop on the fuselage end, first put on a piece of heat shrink, followed by the keeper, and then make your first loop through the connector on the servo arm side and let it rest until you've built the other side. After you've built the first loop, go back through with a pair of forceps and fish the line through to create the second sliding loop. Once you've got the sliding loop, you can pull on the wire attached to the sliding loop to tighten the line. Here I'm doing it with a pair of forceps. After you've got the line tight, you pull on the slider part of the keeper to get the tension that you want and then crimp it with pliers. Demonstrating one more time how to tighten the line. We're actually grabbing the line with the forceps that goes back to the rudder and pulling on it while pulling in the opposite direction on the loop. Once you have it where you want it, you can squeeze the line around the ball link extension to hold everything in place before you actually crimp the little keeper on the line. The pull pull line should be tight, not guitar string tight, but not sloppy loose either. You don't want them so tight that they're pulling on the hinge gap, but you want them just loose enough to where any movement of the rudder actually translates into a movement of the servo arm and there's no slop in the lines. Here I'm just testing the rudder, setting the endpoints to the maximum binding point and making sure that the lines are tight. The next step is to drill the firewall for your motor. If you're using a DA100 or 120, you can use the recommended lasered marks on the firewall, which I am. Once you've drilled the holes, fuel proof them with some thin CA and make sure you have your mounting hardware correct. For a DA120, it will be a 1 inch standoff, and for a DA100, it will be a 3 quarter inch standoff. Other motors will be different. It's important to have the correct standoffs because with the way the cowl mounts on this airplane, there is no adjustment for an aft. Make sure you used hardened one quarter inch bolts or six millimeter bolts and some nice big fender washers on the back of the firewall. The next step will be to build your fuel tank. 
Here I'm installing some 1 8 inch barbs on a 40 ounce Dubro fuel tank. We found that a 32 ounce tank will give you semi short flight time if you fly hard with a DA120. 40 ounce tank will give you a nice solid 12 minute flight plus a reserve. These fuel barbs can be bought at any hobby store and I highly recommend putting them on any of the brass lines in your fuel tanks. In addition to the fuel barbs, I like to put safety wire on all the connections on my fuel tank. Over a year or a season of flying, gasoline can harden and swell Tigon lines. This hardening and swelling can lead to air leaks or even clunk lines coming off inside of the tank. I like to put a safety wire on from two different directions to ensure an airtight seal that will not fail. And even after doing that, I rebuild my fuel tanks once a year at the beginning of each season. The vent line needs to go right up against the top of the tank. I use Tigon for this instead of fuel tubing because vibration over time will eat a hole in the top of the tank if you use the brass tubing for this. Instead, I just bend the brass tubing up slightly and use Tigon as the vent. When setting up the fuel tank, you want to make sure the vent is right at the top of the tank and no further back than about halfway and that the clunk will reach all the way to the back of the tank but not flush on the back of the tank which would choke it for fuel. Labeling the vent in the fuel line will not only help in installing the tank now but later when you're doing maintenance and you've forgotten which is which it'll be very helpful. Since I'm setting up a two line setup here and I'm only using one clunk, you'll need a T in the fuel line as a filler. Here I'm using an aluminum T from Chief Aircraft. Somewhere in your fuel line, you will want to put a filter after the filler tube. Here I'm using a directional Dubro filter. You want to make sure that the direction on the filter is the same as the direction of the fuel flow, in this case from the tank to the engine. And again, I use safety wire to secure all of these connections. You could also use small zip ties if you prefer. When installing the fuel tank, put down a foam rubber tab and secure it in place with Velcro straps. The one key thing here is to make sure that it's not so far back that it's rubbing on the wing tube. The longest piece of fuel line that you'll have on the tank is going to be the vent line. You want to secure the vent line in a loop over the top of the tank. You can use a piece of velcro here to not only lock down the straps that hold the tank in place but also hold down the vent loop. The reason you put the vent into a loop is so that it will not siphon fuel out of the airplane while you're flying. The next line to plumb will be the filler line. Here I'm using a McFueler fuel dot from my friend Mark McClellan up in North Carolina. On the airplane there are four spots for switches, front and back and on both sides. You will not need four switches, you'll only need three. One of those spots is a good place to put the fuel dot because there's a solid piece of plywood there. And again, like with any screw into plywood, I like to secure the threads with a little bit of thin CA. <laughs> 
We're going to fish the filler line off of the T out the fuel dot and cut it to length. We don't want it so long that it flops around inside the fuselage and creates a mess or wears out the fuel line with vibration, but you want it long enough that you can access it with the filler port on your fuel can. To plumb the vent line, you're going to need a hole in the bottom of the motor box to run the vent line through. You will also need a hole in the bottom of the airplane behind the firewall. I've also drilled a couple small holes here so I can safety wire the vent line into place. The reason you need it to exit behind the firewall is because the cowling sits flush against the firewall. Here I'm installing one of the switches in the fuselage. It's important to note that the holes that are marked in the fuselage with laser cutting are actually larger than the recommended JR heavy duty switches. So you'll need to mark the size of the switch on the fuselage. Here I'm using a sharp number 11 blade to scribe out the hole for the switch in the fuselage. Go over the scribe several times with a sharp blade and eventually it'll pop right out. It's a good idea to seal any wood that might be subject to fuel and oil in the future. It's a good idea to make sure that all your switches go in in the same direction, i.e. forward being on or forward being off. I typically like to the rear to be on and to the front to be off for all three switches. Make sure to use blue Loctite when securing the nuts on the switches. In the center two switch positions I have each of the radio batteries and in the forward position is the ignition battery. Next we're going to install the throttle servo but before we do that we need to remove the throttle arm on the butterfly of the DA120. We're going to disengage this return spring. Having this return spring engaged transmits a lot of vibration into the throttle servo which can cause it to fail over time. These basswood blocks are not supplied in the kit, but they're something that I decided to put into the kit to anchor the throttle servo to. I just wanted to have something more substantial to screw into. When choosing a throttle servo, it's important not to skimp. You want a high quality, high speed servo for the throttle. And for my throttle linkage, I made up a dual ball link rod instead of using the easy connector supplied in the kit. When setting up throttle linkage geometry, you want to make sure that your throttle arm is short enough that you get full endpoints over 100 to protect your throttle acuity. I also like to make sure that at full throttle, the servo arm and the push rod are almost in a straight line. This will reduce stress on the throttle servo and protect it over time. Make sure you set your endpoints to get full open and full closed throttle and that your Throttle trim will give you a good idle, yet still shut the butterfly completely. One of the biggest maintenance hassles I've seen with gas engine is people wearing out spark plug wires. So you need to cover them with something. Here I've used a very large Tigon line that I've split in half and put over the spark plug wire. Once you've figured out where you want to mount your ignition, put a foam rubber pad underneath it and zip tie it in place with large zip ties. 
any place where I have a wire or a line that's going to rub on a piece of wood or something that could damage it over time, I cover it with fuel line and zip tie it in place. It's important to figure out how you're going to run your wires so that they're not going to rub on anything or get in the way of anything that moves. Our next step will be installing the mufflers. Make sure you have some high temperature Loctite. I am not installing smoke on this aircraft at this time, but I want to have the option to do it later, so I'm going to install the smoke nipples. Point being, make sure when you install tubing on a muffler that it's high temperature tubing. Regular tie gun would melt right off of this muffler. Prepare the muffler and the gasket with high temperature RTV. Before you install the muffler on the airplane, make sure you wipe out any RTV that would have gotten inside the flange of the muffler. All of this would still apply if you were using pipes and headers. It's important to get the mufflers snug, but if you get them too tight, it's easy to strip the heads of the motor. I find if you use a standard Allen wrench like this, it's pretty hard to get them too tight without bending the wrench. If you are going to use a DA120, you're going to need a specially long wrench to install the muffler on the right side. Pay special attention to this procedure because if you're using mufflers, there is only one way to get the cowling over the muffler tips. To figure out where to cut the muffler holes, put the cowling on as far as it will go and mark where the muffler holes are. This will be the first place that the mufflers need to go through the cowling to get the cowling up over the engine. And then measure from the front of the firewall to the front of the muffler. This will give you where the muffler slot needs to end in the cowling. I'm using a Dremel tool sanding drum to cut these holes for the mufflers. Just start with small holes and work to big holes and check for fit often. After you verify your initial holes, make sure that the gap between the cowling and the firewall pretty much lines up with the holes that you've already marked out in the cowling. 
Once you have the muffler holes rough cut, put the cowling back on and make sure that the channels that you're cutting run straight through the cowling and that the mufflers will line up once the cowling is fully seated. As you get closer to the size holes that you need, start taking out less material and going slowly and looking for a cosmetic finish. Try to fit the cowling ever so often to make sure nothing is rubbing on the muffler. You want to have a good clearance around the muffler with nothing actually touching it. After you get the holes just to the size that you need them, make sure that they are cosmetically straight to the eye as well. The muffler holes will never be centered in the cowling because the engine is offset to one side for right thrust. After you're happy with the holes, go ahead and seal the outsides of the holes with some thin CA. The fiberglass that you've roughed up around the holes is going to be open grain. Sealing it up with CA will definitely make it harder and it will keep the paint from chipping around the holes in the future. The next hole to be cut will be the inlet to the carburetor. One more time, this is the procedure for putting on the cowling if you're running stock mufflers. You may want to baffle the cowling to direct airflow over the heads of the motor. Here I'm using some cardboard templates to cut out some foam baffles. This is Creatology rubberized foam. It's very high temperature. You can use regular CA and get it at Michael's Craft Store. Before you install the cowling, go over the wood joints with thin CA. And one more time, this is the cowling mounting procedure from the front side. The cowling is mounted using three bolts, one from the bottom side and two from the top side inside of the fuselage. No need for a choke lever on this plane, you can reach right through the intake hole and do it with your fingers. Here I am preparing the exhaust vents to install in the fuselage. 
When we're thinking about engine cooling vents, it's important that we have more area in the exit holes than we have in the entrance holes, i.e. we want bigger exhaust vents than we want intake vents. You can either cut them into the cowling, or as I've done here, I've opened the first hole in front of the landing gear block, and I'm going to go ahead and install the pipe tunnel vents as well. Even if you're going to use pipes or canisters, I'd recommend a similar venting system as well. If you wanted to put all the exhaust cutouts in the cowling, it would look something like this. When drilling a prop, the first thing you want to do is move the engine to the compression stroke. This will allow us to mark where we want to drill the holes. We do not want to drill it horizontal or vertically. We want to drill it at about a 30 degree angle. This will put the prop at the right place for hand starting and will also ensure that when we're moving the airplane on the ground or doing a dead stick landing, that the prop blade is not sticking down in the way of the ground. I'm using a DA drill guide here. We want to make sure that the inside holes line up with the mark that we put on the prop. After you've drilled it from one side, remove the drill guide and put it on the other side and drill it again. If you've drilled it correctly, the hub bolts should slide right into position without any binding. A trial fit here shows what the propeller looks like right up against the compression stroke at a 30 to 45 degree angle. Here I'm using a simple prop balancer to balance this prop. You want to make sure that the blade is free of debris and that there's no airflow in the room you're balancing on. This prop has a heavy blade. We're going to use some 600 grit sandpaper to lightly sand the back of that prop. It will wax out later, you'll never see the marks. That was the side that I sanded. This is what a perfectly balanced prop looks like. I will also balance my spinner back plates using the same method. Make sure to use blue Loctite when installing the prop bolts. As you're tightening the hubs, you'll want to make sure you tighten it in a star pattern to make sure it gets tightened evenly. And after the first couple flights, you want to come back and tighten them again to make sure that they're still snug. When you're tightening down a spinner like this, you want to make sure that you have clearance from the back of the prop to the spinner cone and the front of the prop to the spinner cone. You want to make sure that it's tight enough that the spinner will not spin against the back plate, yet that it's not so tight that it'll actually start to deform the back plate. You can see when you tighten it down too much if you look at the back plate that it'll actually start to warp. 
please proceed to build video 4.